Welcome back everyone for today's video we are going to be taking a look at the seventh round of the Grand Swiss which is being held here in the Isle of Man which is a crown dependency of the United Kingdom. Now after six brutal games of chess there was a rest day yesterday so nobody played but today everyone is back in action and I have the white pieces against Alexander Predka from Russia. So in this game I start with the move e4. Predka plays c5 after about a minute thing. Now, I suspect that the reason Predka used a minute is probably he was expecting me to play something like d4, c4, and not actually 1, e4. So I get up to a good start, perhaps slight surprise, but nonetheless, Predka responds pretty quickly. So after c5, I play knight to f3, he goes e6 here, and now I decide to play the move d4. After d4, we get takes, takes, knight f6, knight c3, and now Predka surprises me with this move, knight c6. Now, this could have occurred out of many different orders, potentially. Nonetheless, it is not a system that Predka plays pretty much at all. This is what's known as the Sicilian four knights. Now, I used quite a bit of time here before playing this move a3. Now, the reason I played a3 was essentially to dodge theory. It's very clear that my opponent was prepped to the gills. It's a new system, not something he's ever played before, but nonetheless, something that he clearly has reviewed. And so I don't want to essentially be playing against a computer. So I play a3 here. Reason is pretty simple. I stop the move bishop b4, where I say I play a move like bishop e3. Black can potentially play bishop b4 right away, pressuring the knight and the pawn in the center of the board. If you play a move like f3 to guard <clears throat> the pawn on e4, black has d5 striking in the center immediately, and black is probably a little bit better. So I play a3 to stop bishop b4, and now Predka plays d6, and here I decide to play the move bishop e3. Bishop to e7, and this move, bishop c4. Now, the inspiration behind me playing this move, bishop c4, and going for a pretty classic Sozin setup is none other than the former five-time world chess champion, Magnus Carlsen. Now, the recent European Club Cup held about a month and a half ago, I did a recap of one of Magnus' smashing victories against Vincent Keimer from Germany. Now, one of the funny things is Vincent was actually on the board right next to me. So thinking about trying to, trying to come up with some way to emulate the world champion, seeing Vincent next to me, it felt like a good option. Now, Bishop C4 and the Sozin systems are is a line that was very, very popular in the 1970s, 1980s. It was really popularized by Bobby Fischer, the former world chess champion from the United States of America. In recent times, however, the Sozin setups with Bishop C4 are not considered all that great. Nonetheless, I played it because my opponent was in his preparation, and I thought it would be a good surprise. Lo and behold, my opponent plays Bishop D7 right away. I decide to castle, he castles, and now I play this move f4 after a bit of a think. Now f4 is a move that was based essentially on a miscalculation. Now in this position, I could have it over, have a do-over. I probably would play the move queen to e2, and after black plays a move like let's say rook c8, for example, now maybe I can go bishop a2, maybe I play f4 here, and it's a little bit different. Problem is when I play f4 here, first of all, my opponent goes into a very deep thing after moving pretty much instantly, but then I realize there's a slight problem with one of the lines I've calculated. So we get knight takes knight, bishop takes knight, e5. Now I had calculated this prior to playing the move f4, but there's one thing that I missed. Now my initial intention was take the pawn on e5, and after takes takes, if black plays knight g4 hitting the bishop, First of all, I can't go bishop d4 stopping knight e3 because black has queen c7 hitting the bishop, but also hitting the pawn on h2 with a checkmate threat immediately, and I have to resign or lose a lot of material. So the move that I was going to play here was this move queen to d5. Now this looks fairly crazy here for one very obvious reason. Black can play knight e3, forking the rook, the queen, and the bishop at the same time, but this actually loses spectacularly, and this is the line that I saw during the game. I play rook takes f7, sacking the queen on d5. After knight takes queen, I take the pawn with check, king to h8, I take the bishop with check, black blocks with the knight, and now I go knight to d5 here, and the position is overwhelming for white here with the two b's in the center of the board, the knight and the rook, all my pieces are super active here. One sample line, let's say black goes bishop c6, for example, I can go rook to f1, bishop takes d5, rook takes f6, and all of my pieces are massing towards the black king, and black will actually have to give up a lot of material here to not lose the game. One sample line, queen e7 loses to rook takes f8, which is simply checkmate. If black plays rook takes rook, I take, king g8, I take with check, king f8, and now I go rook f7 check, king e8, I take the queen, and now with an extra bishop on the board, I win quite easily. So, 
This line is completely winning for white, but as I realized while my opponent was going to his deep tank before playing knight takes d4, unfortunately this doesn't work, because after knight g4, queen d5, black can play this very quiet move, bishop c6, attacking the queen. Now rook takes f7 does not work, so after bishop takes queen, check king h8, rook g4, black can block with the bishop, and I don't have the knight on d5 to take the bishop on f6. So I can't play rook f7, and after queen d8, rook a d8 here, the problem is this bishop doesn't have a good square. If I go to g3, there's knight e3, forking the rook and the bishop. If I go to f4 to stop that, then there's bishop c5, check, king h1, and knight f2, check. And suddenly, black is probably winning the game. So unfortunately, I have to play bishop e3 instead. Predka plays knight g4, attacking the bishop. I go queen to e2 here, not bishop c1 because then black has moves like queen b6, followed by knight to f2, and black is much better. So I go queen e2, we get knight takes bishop, queen takes knight, and now Predka plays a surprising move, rook c8. Now at this point during the game, I was obviously very unhappy with my position. I felt that I'm a little bit worse here because black has the two b's, and perhaps I need to be a little bit careful. So here I was expecting Predka to take on f4, and after queen f4, bishop f6, queen d6, and bishop c6, you'll notice that here black is down a pawn, but black has these two great bishops on two great diagonals, and if anybody is better here, it should be black. So if Predka goes rook c8, now I get to play bishop d5, creating a wooden shield in the middle of the board, and after e takes f4, queen takes a7, we have a little bit of an imbalance here, because I have the three pawns on the queen side, black's extra pawn on the king side is doubled although he does have a four on two over on this side of the board but an imbalance is definitely what i want considering the opening has essentially been a bust for me so predka plays bishop g5 guarding the pawn and now i play this move queen f2 now queen f2 is not a bad move per se but one of the reasons i played this move is that i had sort of built up a little bit of a time advantage here and we're very early in the game we're only on move 16 predka down to 30 minutes and i wanted to try to pick up the speed a little bit and put some pressure on the clock that being said, I do think in retrospect, I would have preferred to play bishop b3 here because now the bishop is glued guarding the pawn on f4 and I have ideas like knight to d5 next move. Because when I play queen f2, now Predka can reroute his bishop to a much better diagonal on e5 where black will have a very nice wooden shield and now it's not so easy for white to play. So after bishop f6, I play rook a b1 here. The reason I play this move is that I can't take on f4 due to the check here with the classic right triangle. Because if I go king h1, queen takes b2, the knight and the pawn are both falling instantly, and I lose the game. So I play rook b1, first of all, to threaten to capture both the pawns. But additionally, when black plays bishop e5, now I can take this pawn on b7. Because after rook b8, bishop d5, the rook on b1 guards the pawn on b2. So Predka plays queen f6, and now I play this move knight to e2, moving the knight from being in front of the c pawn. And now I have a simple idea. If black plays a move like g5, I can go b4, c4, and I just start pushing p on the queen side as fast as possible. So after knight e2, Predka plays bishop takes b2, and now the game starts to peter out a little bit because I have to play queen takes f4, queens come off, bishop a3, I play knight d3 here, an important move to try and dominate this bishop on a3 potentially, but also prove that my light square bishop is better than his light square bishop at the same time. So here Predka plays bishop e6, which I think is a slight inaccuracy, probably rook b8 is a little bit better here, because if I ever go rook a1, bishop c5 and trade, and I go rook a7 after bishop to e6, black is completely fine here, and the game should end in a draw very soon. Instead, Predka plays bishop e6, and now after I trade the rooks and go rook to a1, I start to get a slight advantage here. Predka plays the move bishop c5. Now, Predka was a little bit low on timer, so it's hard to be critical, but probably bishop takes bishop and rook a would have been okay, but it's very hard to voluntarily walk into this pin on the a file, especially because if you play a move like rook a5 and I go rook a2, you can't go bishop b4 to guard the rook, because then I take the bishop and I guard my own rook. And after rook a7 knight b4, it looks really, really scary because black cannot untangle the bishop and the rook from this pin. Nonetheless, after, after we get king up, king up one here, rook a5, rook a2, probably black can just play a move like h5 because I'm simply not in time when I go king e2 and you get rook a7. If I move the king, there's bishop c5. If I go knight b4, there's rook to e7 check, winning the bishop. And so I simply can't keep the pin alive. Nonetheless, Predka plays bishop c5. I take, he takes, and now I go rook to a5, going after this pawn on c5. Here, Predka plays king to f8, which I think is a great practical decision. Now, 
Predka could have played rook to c8 to guard the pawn, but now after king f2, king f8, king e3, king e7, king d3, king d6, and king c4, white has a little bit of an advantage here because the rook is tied down guarding the pawn. If black ever trades, I can potentially get two connected pawns, and it's really, really tricky to play at this point. So when Predica plays king f8, I think it's a great move because what he wants to do is give up the pawn on c5, but activate his rook and bring his king into the center of the board as quickly as possible. Here I play the move h4. Now this was actually a mistake. I probably should have played c4 first because as soon as I played h4, I realized that Predica could have traded the bishops. I cannot take with the pawn here to connect the two pawns because after king d6 attacking the rook and the pawn, if I go rook a5, rook b2, black will win back one of these two pawns and the game will end in a draw. So he plays rook d1 very quickly, just a mistake here. And now I go c4, correcting my error so that I can always capture back and reconnect the two pawns. Predka plays rook c1, and now I go king to f3. He plays the move king d6. I check king e5, and now I make a huge mistake after a very long think with this move rook c7. Now, if I wanted to have any chances of winning this game, the move I had to play was bishop takes bishop, because after pawn takes bishop and rook c7, I'm going after the two pawns on g7 and h7. Now, during the game, the line that I actually expected if I had played this, in fact, loses the game, which is this move rook c3 check. King g4, h5 takes, and rook g3. Now, what I miscalculated, I think, is that I saw rook c5 and rook g5. But after takes and king d4, king g6, e5 takes, e4, king f8, e3, g6, e2, g7, e1, g8. I think I just assumed in my mind that probably black could check, somehow win some pawns, and draw this very easily due to a repetition. When, in fact, this position is winning because black cannot actually keep the checks alive. If you go queen b4 check, I go king g7, queen e7, queen f7. Sorry, not queen f7 here. I go king g6, and after queen d6, now I can go king f5, queen e5, king g4, and I can slowly zigzag my king backwards, and this is a technical win. Now, again, to see this would have, would have been really, really good. Nonetheless, there are other ways for black to play, but I do not know whether my opponent in this position would have gone for this rook c3 and h5, or whether he might have played something like h6 or h5 right away. Now, if he were to play this move h6 here, or not h6, sorry, h5 here, for example, this probably should still be a draw, because if I take on g7, there's rook c3 check, king f2, black can now play the move, I believe, I believe it's um, king f4 here, because if I play g3, king e4, and then I go rook g5, for example, black can take, check, king g1, and after king f3, rook g5, and e5 here, black just starts pushing the e pawn down the board, and I'll probably have to capture it in return for giving up the pawn on g3. Additionally, if I play the move rook c5, rook h5, takes, and say rook a5 here, after e5 check, king f7, h5, and rook b4, black basically just keeps yo-yoing yo on the fourth rank. If I ever check, he comes up. So basically, he yo-yos between these squares, or f6 and f7. And at the end of the day, this still should be a draw. But we'll never know whether I would have gotten winning chances because this is a, the only line to save the game. Whereas if he went for the much more logical line with rook c3 and h5, I probably would win the game. So... Unfortunately, after a long thing, I don't go for it. I play the move rook c7 instead. And once I play this move, black is completely fine. Because after check king f2, check king g3, he checks my king back to h2, plays g6. And now I can't really push the c pawn without losing material in the center of the board. I can't really trade the bishops, and the game is simply drawn. So we get rook c6, h6. I play the move rook c7. He goes g5. Now, of course, I play h5, trying desperately to keep as many pawns on the board as possible. We get to move king f4, I go c5, g4, have to take, if I play c6, after g3, check, king g1, and rook c1, it's uh-oh, spaghetti -o time, checkmate, and I lose the game. So I go bishop e6, takes, I play c6 here, and Predka plays a very important move, king g5. Now, this is not the only move to draw, but it is the most solid, and it takes away any potential swindles. So I play rook g7, we get king h5, I go c7. He plays the move e5, and now I go for g3. And the game concludes after rook c2, king g1, check, king f1, check, king e1, check, king d1, check, king c1, rook c2. And finally, I take the rook on c2 here. And after king takes c2, this is a classic stalemate. The black king has no squares. So the game ends in a draw, despite the fact that I'm ahead by one rook. So a difficult game. 
Opening did not go the way I wanted. I had some slight chances there in that late middle game, or not late middle game, I should say, early end game potentially if I played for that rook c7 move. Probably would have been a draw anyway, but there was a chance for my opponent to go wrong. So I do feel a little bit unhappy about not, not making him find the best defense in that scenario. But again, it still is what it is, and the game ends in a draw. So let's move on to the next game. Now, on the score group of players who were tied for the lead were two other players, Vidic Gujarati from India. Very talented player, a little bit unsung because of all the rising juniors, Prag and Nanta, Arjun, and of course, Gukesh as well. So a little bit unsung, but he's having a very, very good tournament so far. I believe after losing the second round to Erwin Lamy, he actually won three or four games in a row. He's tied for the lead going into this round as well. And he's playing against Uzbeki junior, Yabokir Sindarov, who won a great game against Sam Sepin in the previous round, which we covered in the last round's recap. So this game starts with E4. We get E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, Bishop C4, Bishop C5, d3, d6, c3, and now we get to move bishop b6, castles, and knight to f6. Now, this is very, very similar to my first round game against Rasmus Swain from Germany, except Rasmus had already castled and rookie one had been included, but nonetheless, we have another classic Gucci piano, and it's one of these bishop b6 variations. So, Cinderov plays a4, we get a5 from Vidit, bishop e3, trade, and now castles is played, knight bd2, Knight to e7 here, knight h4 played, and now we have the move d5. Now this is very, very dry, very boring, I would say, in terms of theoretical knowledge or theoretical lines that matter, because here, white doesn't really have a big attack. He just simply has an f-file. Black can always play for c6 or d5 in one go, and it's pretty balanced. So we get d5, ed5, knight e takes d5. We get to move queen f3, knight b6 is played here, and now Cinderov plays e4. Now, it looks like Cinderov has a small advantage here because he's a nice bishop on the diagonal. If black ever takes, now you can target the pawn on e5 right away, maybe even queen g3, followed by knight f3 as well. And when you combine that with the open f file, it looks like a significant advantage. So, Vita plays queen d6. We get to move queen to e2 here. Now, I think this already is a step in the wrong direction, probably playing h3 here to stop bishop g4 so that if black plays rook d8, you can play like rook fd1, or maybe, I guess rook a d1 here hangs upon an a4. But ideas that prevent bishop g4 means that black basically will only be able to go to e6 or d7. If black ever goes to e6, you also always have knight to f5 at some point. So h3 is just a very logical move. Stops all the jumps to g4, creates lift for the king, and it's a little bit better than what happens in the game. So we get queen to e2, bishop g4, knight hf3. This also feels a little bit wrong to me, probably queen e3. Ideas of knight f5 or h3 make some sense. It is what it is. We get knight hf3, rook a d8, h3, bishop h5. And now we have this very aggressive move, g4 from Cinderella. Now, g4 is a move that I think is a little bit too optimistic here. Once again, a move like queen e3, offering the trade and taking with the knight and playing some end game like this should be good enough to draw. But it's very important that you don't let the game get completely out of control. And this is also something I think for the players who are at the very top, they're very good at understanding when the game is starting to spiral out of control and when to shut it down, even if they have the white pieces. So Cinderella plays g4 going all in. We get bishop g6, rook fd1, guarding the pawn on d3, knight d7 is played. And now it's very clear that black has the upper hand because Vita can play knight c5, pressure pawn on d3 and a4, but also go for knight e6 and knight f4 to create a bastion as well. So we get bishop b3, knight c5, knight c4, queen f6 played here, and now we have bishop to a2, and beat it goes rook f8. And here we get this move, king g2, which is simply a big mistake. Now it's already very hard for white to play because your pawn on a4 is under attack here twice. You're also worried about knight e6 and knight f4 as well, and you don't have a pawn break in the center because after d4 takes, suddenly your e4 pawn is super, super weak as well. So... King g2 played by Cinderov, probably here the computer wants. I guess queen e3 is better, but very hard to understand. We get king g2, knight b takes a4, h4 is played. Cinderov trying to attack on the king's side desperately, and now we get queen f4. Knight takes e5, takes, 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 and this move h5. Now h5 simply loses the game on the spot, but Cinderov here probably figure, you know what? My opponent has two pieces for the rook. He's also got a pawn. My king is super open. I gotta go all in. So we get h5, but now Vita plays rook takes d3, sacking the rook here, and after bishop takes f7, 
we get this great move king to f8. If white were to take right away on d3, after knight takes d3, if white takes the queen, there's bishop takes e4, winning the queen or ending the game. If you take the bishop on g6, there's knight f4, and the knight forks the king and the queen. So we get bishop f7, and Vita quietly ignores it here, because if he were to take with the bishop, after takes, 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 there's no bishop takes e4 anymore. And if you take with the king, I take with check, and suddenly out of nowhere, white has a rook for a knight, and he will win the game. So we get king f8, rook takes d3 is played, white does not have time to take the bishop on g6, because after queen g3 here, if you go king f1, there's rook f3, you have to give up the queen and lose the game. You go king h1 here, there's queen 2, I think h3 or h4 both work, but queen h3 is probably simplest. King g1, rook g3, king f2, rook g2, black wins the queen and the game. And if you block with the queen, there's queen f3 check, and after queen g2, takes, 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 king h2, Everything wins, but let's just say h takes g6 is simply good enough with queen d6 check on the next turn. So we get rook d3. Knight takes d3 is played. Cinderov plays queen to e3 here, and now we have queen takes e4, takes, takes, king g3, king takes f7, rook takes a4. And now after bishop c6, the dust is settled, and after rook a5, knight b2, we have a situation where black is a bishop, knight, and a pawn for the rook, and he should be winning. But... One of the big critiques of Vita, I mean, critiques is the wrong word, is that it feels like whenever he's in really, really big situations, somehow something inevitably goes wrong for him in the World Cup. He lost his match to Abasov when he should have been the big favorite. I feel like looking back to the Fede Grand Prix, he lost a couple games to Richard Report where he was much better. And it just feels like somehow things don't go his way, which is really unfortunate because he's obviously a very nice guy and he has great potential. So would this be another situation is the big question. So we get rook f5, king e7, rook e5, king f7, rook f5, king g8, rook e5, and now Vita plays knight a4, trying to go after this last queenside pawn so that he can start pushing the p. We get c4, knight to b6 is played, we get g5 here, and now the move king f7 is played. Now, the reason that Vita did not take the pawn on c4 is because after rook to e7, Knight e6, rook c7. Suddenly, black only has one pawn on the queen side. And additionally, your king is very passive. Down the road, white can maybe play h6 or g6. And it's not actually clear to me whether black is even winning this position. So Vita plays king f7 to cut off the kebab on the seventh rank. We get rook f5, king e7, check. King d8 now. Again, no entry. Rook f5 back, trying to always enter on the seventh rank. King e7, check. King d6. And now Vita plays the move king e6. Now, what Vita's been doing here is basically gaining 30 seconds for every extra move, but also making sure he gets closer to move 60 so that he will get more time um, added to his clock. So we get rook f8, knight c4, rook h8, and now Vita plays the move knight d6. Now this is still good enough, but it's a, the technique is a little bit shaky here. Bishop to e4 would have been a little bit better here because after rook to e8 and king d5, rook e7, now you can simply go knight d6, rook c7, and just start pushing the peat really, really fast. White cannot take on g7 because there's knight f5 forking the king and the rook. So we get knight d6 here, rook h7, and now bishop e4, g6 played. Rook g7 again loses to knight f5, and if you if you play the move rook h8, now once again black can start pushing. So g6 is played, we get b5, king f4, b4, rook h8, and now Vita does not see the boogeyman for once, he continues to push the p on the b file. We get rook b8 here. Now again, it would be very easy to get scared about something like h6 and g5, like say h6, takes g7, not g5, sorry, g7, white gets a queen, you go here, there's h7, h8. Now, during my live commentary on kick after my game, I did see this line, and the computer says this is still winning for black, but at the end of the day, it's very hard to allow this when you've been trying to dodge counterplay the whole game. So, Vita plays bishop d5 instead, which is actually even nicer, because now, after, after white plays king e3, although I guess I should say white should play h6, after takes g7, king f6, queen, takes takes in this position black is a great move knight to c4 if you go rook to b8 for example there's knight b6 shielding the rook and now after say rook g8 b2 rook g1 knight to a4 you have to go rook b1 because otherwise there's knight c3 which wins the game so you have to go rook b1 and now after h5 the white people is ruled the day and white actually can't get the king back king e4 runs into a fork king e3 also runs into a fork via d1 so you can't actually get the king back, and if you go king f3, I can now go c5 here. Still can't go king e2, because there's check, and if you go king f2, now I believe there's knight c3, which also forks the rook and the king once again. So, for that reason, Cinderov plays king e3, but now after b2, we get h6, you can't take due to the fork. Get h6, 
takes, king d4 is played, and now knight f5, king c5, and here the move c6 played by beat it to plant this bishop, this wooden shield on d5, and after rook b2 and king f6, Cinderov resigns the game because he will lose this pawn on g6, there's no way to guard it, and once black has the white peoples with the bishop and the knight, this will be very, very routine. So a huge win for Vita. For once, it finally goes his way in the critical moments. He is now in the clear lead, I believe, after eight rounds. Someone might catch him, but more likely than not, he will be the sole leader. So it's great to see Vita doing well, and, um, and we'll see what happens tomorrow. So on that note, you guys, I hope you've enjoyed this recap. A little bit late here, so I'm trying to get through this as quickly as I can because the game seems to be getting longer and longer, more and more prep, everyone getting more and more tired. So I hope you guys have enjoyed the recap, the dedication that I put in towards um, towards making these videos every single day, despite my results, despite how I might feel energy-wise. So if you haven't already, make sure to smash that subscribe button below, and I will be back tomorrow with another recap after the eighth round of the Grand Swiss, which is being held here 